Hello, folks, and welcome back to World War II TV and the fourth part in Codes and Codebreakers. But as you have found out, as you've been watching the show so far, Codes and Codebreakers are, in fact, just a starting point. It's about radio intercept. It's about the use of information. It's about sending uh, information back to commanders. It's the Codes and Codebreaking was kind of the tag to bring you all in. There's a much bigger picture out there. But so far... Uh, we've tackled the work of Bletchley Park. We tackled yesterday with Matt Azulo. We talked about the U.S. Navy role, role with the On the Roof gang. But today we're looking at primarily the British role in the Far East. But of course, it connects with Americans and Australians as well, because we were all in this together. So my guest is another expert in the field. Dr. Andrew Boyd has been writing about this subject. Naval intelligence generally he has a new book coming out uh, next month that I will talk about he will talk about the links to purchasing it are in the description below so as usual i urge you to check that out um but without further ado i'm going to introduce my guest um hello andrew how are you doing this afternoon or this evening i'm very well thank you hi everybody so um you know you've seen some of the things we've done this week and it's a broad subject and it seemed like four four or five days was was quite a lot of time to tackle this subject i'm now realizing it's not very much time at all and there are massive amounts of rabbit holes we could go down and all these branches of of, 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 of interest. But for you, you're an ex-submariner with the Royal Navy. When did you first get involved in or interested in the kind of the, the, the intelligence side of it? Um, well, I think I've, I've always been interested in history. I've always read history. Um, my interests are pretty eclectic, but um, 20th century naval history has a particular appeal. Um, more formal um, interest as a historian started 10 years ago and I ended up doing first an MA and then a doctorate and that focused on the Royal Navy in the Eastern Theatre from uh, 35 to 42 which subsequently became a book. Um, the driver for that was my sense that the traditional explanations for uh, British failure in the East at the beginning of the Eastern War were not satisfactory. Um, I didn't feel that lack of resources, imperial overstretch, underestimation of the Japanese enemy was quite sufficient. And uh, I think after my researches, I'd like to feel I was proved right about that. Um, so that got me into uh, intelligence, naval intelligence specifically in regard to that book. From there, having done that book, um, that took me, why not take a much broader look across the whole 20th century? Well, brilliant stuff. And it is interesting that people are really starting to evaluate, re-evaluate the Far Eastern theatre. Robert Lyman's new book, A War of Empires, just coming out. And it's, as you probably know, kind of the culmination of 30 years of his research. And he's realising he's in a very different place now, 30 years on, from understanding that campaign than he was at the beginning of his research. And I think perhaps with the ETO and, and the, even the Mediterranean, we've there's, there's still more things to say, but it, a lot of things have already been said. With the Far East, Southeast Asia, there is, I think, a lot more still to be said on that subject, particularly as we get, we talked about it on previous shows, we get more input from, from the Indian historians and, and historians of other countries that haven't perhaps been participating in the in the appreciation of that of that, of that sector. So I think we're, we're on the brink of quite an exciting time in terms of understanding that that area but anyway as usual we're going to crack on with the show um so we are talking about far east combined bureau so as with matt yesterday this this is an operation that started before the war um so we're starting in the 1930s there so um which is a time when the british empire of course extends to most areas of the globe including places we'll be mentioning later hong kong singapore so give us the origins of of, of intelligence in in that theater if you wouldn't mind OK, um, well, in turn, why, why don't I start with origins? I mean, um, the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922 offers Britain uh, many advantages, or at least some advantages, but it also creates a potential problem because it ends the Anglo-Japanese alliance, which has guarded uh, Britain's interests in the East for 20 years. Japan is still... Uh, friendly, but clearly the relationship uh, could now change. Japan has the third largest navy in the world, and Washington leaves her uh, very much dominant in uh, naval power in the Western Pacific. So Britain has to think, 
has to think, what do we do if Japan were ever to become unfriendly? Um, there's deep reluctance to deploy a permanent fleet in the East um, that would be competitive to Japan. So the answer is we need a small uh, Eastern force and then we need um, the ability to, to reinforce that uh, a force with a full fleet that uh, can compete with Japan. That will need a base. The base we choose is Singapore. Uh, the strategy for reinforcement becomes the famous Singapore, Singapore strategy. Now, in dealing with Japan, the, there are three cardinal principles. It's assumed uh, Japan is the only real risk. And I'm looking now at the, in the early 1920s. So there is no other conceivable threat to the British uh, Empire in the East. It's Japan. For Japan to uh, implement um, an attack on British interests or territory, it can only come by sea. I mean, Japan um, is miles, thousands of miles from uh, most British territories, even, even Hong Kong, which is arguably the nearest. Um, so it can only mount an attack by sea. Um, it follows that Britain can only counter such an attack by sea. Um, so that's the context where we start in the 20s. Through the 20s, Japan remains essentially not only friendly to Britain, but a constructive member of the international community. But in the 30s, that has begun to change. Now, as we enter the 30s, Britain has established... Um, um, a certain intelligence infrastructure to watch Japan that comprises really, I would say, three elements. Um, the Tokyo uh, military and naval attaches um, who have a good sense of um, um, Japanese uh, order of battle and uh, uh, military naval, naval intentions. Uh, Japan is uh, very much a buyer of uh, British equipment. So British arms companies have a lot of insights into uh, how Japan is thinking and where they're going with modernization of uh, uh, of their military and, and naval forces. And finally, Britain recreates a small naval SIGINT capability, having effectively allowed that to lapse at the end of uh, at the end of the First World War. Now, in the early 30s, as I've already suggested, things change. Japan moves in British perception remarkably quickly from uh, friendly and constructive partner to hostile and dangerous potential enemy. Why? Because Japan really quite suddenly, though the reasons stretch back, adopts uh, a militaristic and aggressive uh, policy that will lead her into uh, China, um, full scale of invasion of China in 1937, and ultimately to confrontation with the Western powers. So as Britain looks at uh, her position in the, the early 30s, um, she clearly needs to think about uh, uh, giving more credibility to that Singapore strategy, uh, ensuring defences are adequate uh, to survive before a fleet can uh, arrive in the Far East, and she needs better intelligence. And that creates the origins of the Far East Combined Bureau. Uh, nicely done. So, uh, and, and essentially, if I'm kind of following this and my own understanding is, we, we know that if Japan starts becoming aggressive in that area and starts expanding, it's there's a couple of things it's going to need. One is going to be harbours. So, so as we know later on, people like places like Singapore, Port Moresby, and other such harbours become important. But of course logistics and supplies and rubber and oil and fuel and all the things they would need to expand are going to be important. So in a sense, we, we would have an idea or the allies at this point, it's not the allies, Britain would have an idea about what direction the Japanese would be going. And is it a sense in terms of developing intelligence of being able to perhaps predict uh, in advance where they might be going and where more importantly, or as importantly, when they might be going and which order they might be doing things in because as we talked about when we had um, we did a show about Malaya recently with um, a group of historians, and the, the, we'll get into the, the Singapore strategy later on. It all depends on buying enough time for uh, uh, fleets from elsewhere to make it to that theatre. So 
theoretically any extra time we can buy from intelligence is giving that a fighting chance. Is that sort of a, a, a layman's um, understanding of what the basic policy or aims would be of intelligence in that in that theatre? Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about intentions and uh, and and capability. Um, Japan is becoming more militaristic and aggressive. Is she going to start uh, looking southwards beyond China to uh, uh, British Empire interests and territory? And don't forget, Britain has bases in China. Hong Kong is uh, the most obvious, but there are also concessions in Shanghai and uh, Tianjin. So, and Britain actually has troops in all three of those uh, uh, in all three of those areas. So. Japan's confrontation with China immediately affects Britain, as, in, as indeed it does America. So intentions are important. From Britain's perception, Japan is modernizing uh, um, noticeably. Um, her Navy uh, is already becoming very competitive in most uh, areas of, uh, of modern equipment. So if we move to uh, the Far East Combined Bureau, yep. so what is it? It's uh, set up in May 1935. It's a tri-service organization, but it is um, um, Navy dominant, dominated. And um, it's essentially got uh, three, three elements. Um, it's got an assessment center for the collation and uh, assessment of intelligence from, uh, from all sources. It's got uh, a SIGIN center um, which um, comprises uh, SIGIN collection, processing, and assessment, which is then fed into the uh, to the primary assessment centre. And finally, thirdly, there is a thing called the Pacific Naval Intelligence Organisation, which one should think of as essentially a, a large maritime plot of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and it seeks to convey all relevant maritime information that affects Britain from uh, the east coast of Africa through to the west coast of uh, uh, North America. Um, the role of uh, the Bureau is uh, threefold. Um, to give early warning of Japanese attack, so back to your uh, point just now, um, to keep track of the Japanese order of battle, so what are their frontline forces, how are they uh, developing, re-equipping, modernizing, etc.? And um, if war breaks out, to provide operational intelligence uh, uh, as the war as the war progresses. The bureau is headed by a chief of intelligence staff, COIS, who throughout its seven-year life is always a Royal Navy captain, and uh, in line with my reference to Navy dominance. Uh, it reports to, is accountable to, and is supervised by the Commander-in-Chief of the China Fleet, which is uh, the Royal Navy's permanent force in the, in the Pacific. Now, the Bureau is in many ways rather innovative. It's quite unusual, even in the British system, to have a, a tri-service organisation, though that concept uh, is beginning to be replicated in uh, other parts of the intelligence community, not least the Joint Intelligence Committee at the strategic level, which is about to be set up. And that will continue to be a pattern through, uh, um, well, through the rest of the 1930s and the war to come. It's very unusual compared to other powers. And indeed, I can't think of another major power that replicates this sort of tri-service system in, uh, in this time. Most of them go for a competitive system where uh, each service has its own intelligence system and they're almost encouraged to, to, to compete. Uh, both systems have advantages and disadvantages, mm. I would say, but I'm biased that um, mm. the British system probably comes out best. Um, I mentioned the concept of an assessment centre I don't think in May 1935 that term would have been would have been used. I think uh, um, the chiefs of staff and through them uh, Far East commanders are looking for a better intelligence system. 
they want to do it together. Um, they recognize there's a variety of sources out there. They can see that SIGINT is uh, perhaps uh, the dominant one at this time. Um, they often rather struggle to understand what SIGINT is really going to provide them in a wartime situation, because what it provides in peacetime is not particularly useful in judging those key things, intentions and, uh, and capability. There's an awful lot of low-level stuff. Hence the hankering, can we bring this all together and provide something, uh, something better? And that so you say, you know, the, the, sorry to interrupt the, about the tri-service nature of it, but you know, we talked with Matt and we've talked with David Kenyon about the, the, the formation of other specialist units. And um, you, you said earlier that the British had perhaps let their SIGINT and intelligence capabilities kind of lapse into the First World War. So this this new um, this new operation, the Far East Combined Bureau, is it is it revolution or evolution, or is it a bit of both? I mean, they're, they're obviously drawing on some prior experience in that theatre, but there's obviously got to be some some new thinking as well because the world is changing, military technology is changing. You know, in the 1930s, particularly, is the revolution of everything. Aircraft are changing, and 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 tank warfare is developing. So, uh, revolution or evolution? Which, which would you think it is? Um. I think a, a combination of both. Let me expand on that. Um, you have um, a small naval SIGINT capability that has developed over uh, the previous uh, 12 years or so, in fact, from 1924, so just over, just over 10 years. Um, now, naval SIGINT comprises um, uh, three elements, and Matt touched on this quite a bit last, uh, la last night. Um, so you've got um, direction finding, mm -hmm. uh, first, first of all, you, um, you, you hear a radio signal and you get a bearing on that, uh, um, on that radio, radio signal. And you could get that bearing uh, from a shipborne receiver uh, or from a shore-based shore receiver. Then there is traffic analysis, which is looking at uh, uh, traffic patterns and using them to build a picture of uh, um, a hostile organization's uh, organization and, uh, and deployment. I mean, you're not actually reading their messages. I mean, you may be doing that as well, but you're doing this on the basis of what you, what you hear and what you can plot out. And then finally, there is uh, code breaking. And by the time uh, FECB is, is set up, uh, the Navy has established uh, a fairly good organization embracing all those three areas. And code breaking um, uh, has been quite successful because at this stage, Japanese codes are fairly simple and, uh, and easy to break. Now, in dealing with code breaking, we need to mention uh, another organization, which is uh, Britain's primary SIGINT organization, the Government Code and uh, uh, Cipher School, which is uh, set up in 1919 and is um, uh, Britain's uh, uh, single overarching uh, SIGINT, SIGINT agency. And it, uh, it brought together um, the, the separate army and, and navy organizations that had operated through uh, uh, the Second World War and embraced the diplomatic code breaking that each of them had also under, un, undertaken. Um, now, <clears throat> as FE, FECB is set up, it's drawing on that naval heritage, but the Navy has been working closely with GCNCS and FECB will continue, continue to do so. And insofar as the division, there is a division of labor you should assume that uh, um, FECB is handling military SIGINT in the Far East with a particular focus on naval SIGINT and GCNCS is handling uh, diplomatic SIGINT. I mean, it's not precise, but that's mm. a, a broad... broad uh, yeah. But, uh, but let's look at that 1930s you. period because if there's one takeaway in the prep I've done for this week and and I was, I was talking to David Kenyon offline about... My it was 25 years in between my visits to Bletchley Park, something like that. And I went there at the beginning of its of its finding its fame and went there when there's the shop and everything and books. And I think 
the explosion of interest in codes and code breaking has been on the one hand beneficial for people who are writing about that aspect but it's also i think led people the general public to perhaps think that all of this work begins only once the first shots have been fired in World War II. I think that's my takeaway, is they all think it's a, a wartime reaction as opposed to the, a development and improvement of techniques that were developed before the war. And, I, and I'm, um, I'd like to, therefore, to expand on this this late 1930s period in, 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 in the FECB, because you know, how are they getting on with that? You, you mentioned the other intelligence organizations. What's what skills and sort of um, base are they acquiring in those four years that would have proved to be va invaluable when the war when the war actually started? Um, that's a that's that's a good question, and um, I think the the thing we need to establish first of all, I said Japanese codes are um, simple at uh, at at this stage. Um, there is in fact. Uh, uh, one exception, um, their naval and military attaches uh, in 1935 have just started uh, using a machine cipher. It's not as sophisticated as uh, as Enigma, but it, it marks a, a break with previous uh, practice, and it's not straightforward for GCNCS to break it. But through some innovative work, they do manage to do so within about within about a year. But uh, all the other Japanese um, um, uh, codes at this time are, are, are book are book based, and that will remain the case essentially through to uh, 19, 1939. And um, and they are all, uh, to one degree or another, largely uh, largely readable, um, though more so on the on the naval and diplomatic side than. Uh, uh, Japanese Japanese army side. Um, as we come up to uh, um, to the end of the 1930s, um, there is going to be a fundamental shift. Uh, the Japanese, like the Germans before them, move to machine system machine systems uh, in uh, the diplomatic uh, sphere. Uh, they put uh, all their uh, primary communications with their major diplomatic posts uh, in a new system called Purple, which is, is machine-based and is, uh, is very difficult to, uh, to break. Um, they actually remain uh, uh, book-based for their primary naval fleet, fleet code, but uh, it is uh, far more sophisticated. And as we will uh, uh, find out, um, it proves extremely difficult to break. And Matt mentioned uh, that code JN25 uh, yesterday. Um, the naval attaches and indeed the military attaches also go on to a, an even more sophisticated machine system and the naval attache system, which uh, opens up in 1939, is one of the most sophisticated systems of the war and is not broken till 1943. Wow. But you know, we, and we will we will get to the, I guess the, the the crucial 1939 1940 period where everything changes, not least of which because the war, at least in Europe, has begun. Although, of course, you are referencing the fan the, the fact that the Japanese and China have been at it for some time already. But um, then we get to the point where there's the move from Hong Kong to Singapore. Now, we talked you talked about the Singapore plan earlier on. Is that is the move of, of the bureau to do with that Singapore plan, or is it for another reason? Um, all right, well, ju just before we come to that, let me sure. say a little bit about uh, how FECB has uh, evolved between 1939 and 1939. It's in 1939 that the, the move to Singapore uh, takes place. We've already talked about uh, the nature of uh, Japanese codes, the fact they're readable in this, uh, in this period. So we should think about FECB between 35 and 39 as... Um, Navy dominated, we've already stressed that. Um, it's small, and I would describe it essentially as a, as a SIGINT plus organization. The bulk of its intelligence is coming from SIGINT, reflecting that success in reading uh, Japanese codes. Um, it gets useful information from uh, other human sources, notably the attaches in, uh, in, in Tokyo. 
um, after the Japanese invade uh, uh, China in uh, 1937. Uh, there are um, military attaches, um, British military attaches uh, uh, established in, in China who can report uh, um, information of considerable value on uh, the progress of the war and uh, the Japanese capability that um, uh, they can uh, uh, they can see taking effect. Um, SIS, the Human Intelligence Service, is of course present in the Far East, but is neither particularly effective at this time, um, nor does it enjoy a particularly comfortable relationship with uh, with FECB. Um, so. So where does that leave us in, in 1939, going back to your question about mm -hmm. uh, Japanese high-level intent and capability? Um, FECB hasn't done badly on either of those. Um, on intent, um, Japanese diplomatic um, codes remain, remain readable. Uh, GCNCS is tackling most of that. Um, and uh, that GCNCS coverage produces one of the most important uh, pieces of intelligence, I would say, in the whole interwar period, because it provides uh, a pretty comprehensive view of Japanese thinking regarding the anti comintern pact, which uh, establishes the birth of the Axis, mm -hmm. um, a relationship with Germany and Italy. And very importantly, in 1939, it shows that German and Italian overtures to embark on a more formal military alliance that extends an anti-Soviet alliance to other towards other countries is rejected by the Japanese. And they actually say, we don't want to do this at this time. Uh, good relations with Britain and America are too important to us for commercial reasons while we're heavily engaged in a war with China. Um, and that gives Britain tremendous reassurance as we get into the final run up to the European war in September 1939, that Japan is unlikely to, uh, to join with, uh, with Germany, as indeed she does not. Thankfully, yeah. Um, um, in terms of um, keeping an eye on Japanese military capability, um, SIGINT is good when allied with what the attaches can provide, insights from China in uh, keeping a fairly good track on, on Japanese order of battle. So I would say in 1939, the picture is not at all bad. But in the summer of 1939, things become a lot more difficult because, as I've already said, a key part of the diplomatic traffic closes off as they move to a machine system and the Japanese Navy shift to a much more sophisticated uh, code book, JN25. As which, yeah, which we talked about. Yeah. But if, even, even if they hadn't been able to understand some of this traffic and understood the relationship between Japan and, and, the, and the Axis, at the very least, there's an, there's an infrastructure that's been established. There's at least a base to work on. Sure, they've now got to devise means of cracking new codes and, and intercepting from different technology, but there's a there's a core base to start with. And I think that's the one of my takeaways. I'm kind of repeating myself from this week is that I think a lot of people, again, they think this idea of code breaking and intelligence sort of starts only when the, the gunshot guns have been fired, but actually there's a base in place before the war. And yes, it has to adapt and, and, and deal with the, the technology changes, but there is this essential kind of track record that British and Americans have that, that they can work on, which I think is, it's nice to know that we we weren't just twiddling our thumbs all through the 1920s and 30s doing nothing at all. It's it's it, that's that that's good, I think. So, um, but yeah, well, let's let's move to the, the the move from Hong Kong to Singapore. Okay, um, Hong Kong was always uh, recognised to be uh, uh, to be vulnerable as a site for uh, FECB because in wartime, uh, even before the full invasion of uh, China in 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 1937. Um, it's easy to see that it's going to be a lot more vulnerable than uh, uh, the other British territories in, in the East. So the chiefs of staff, even in 1936, a year after its founding, are beginning to press 
perhaps we should move FECB somewhere else, and the obvious place is uh, uh, is, is is Singapore. Um, the reasons that, um, and of course, the invasion of China the following year gives even greater impetus to that. I'd say the core reason it doesn't happen is that um, you have um, CNC China fleet based in uh, based in Hong Kong, and he's reluctant to see his primary uh, intelligence organization move to a, mm. a completely different base um, several thousand miles away. Um, and then there are the logistic issues. It's initially difficult to find suitable sites in Singapore and people don't want the turbulence, et cetera, et cetera. So it does take us to 1939 when with uh, the international situation getting ever grimmer and war looming, even possibly in the Far East, Hong Kong is really not tenable and the move eventually takes, uh, the move eventually takes place. Um, by this time, in line with what you've said, there is a growing um, SIGINT infrastructure. Uh, there are now a number of shore-based uh, uh, DF sites in, in the Far East. Um, traffic analysis has become uh, much more sophisticated. And indeed, I would say FECB is probably uh, the most advanced part of the overall British system in uh, tackling uh, traffic analysis. So absolutely what you say about uh, developments pre-war, uh, they have been underway in the East. But now we have this crucial period so where the, the storm clouds are very uh, just about to, to, to you know hover in in Europe. That was a very bad phrase there. I'll start that one again. But you know, war is really looming in Europe. But we've now got we now know with hindsight, it's kind of two years before it really gets going in the far in the in the Far East. But during this time, we've got this lot lots of things going on. So they're still getting this Japanese traffic, or they've got these new codes to deal with. How how are FECB understanding what's happening in Europe, uh, and how does that affect what they're they're working with the Japanese, and what are they doing in those? key vital two years before it all it all kicks off in their own theater okay well they so the japanese decision not to intervene in september 1939 as i've said is is not a surprise but of course um keeping out may not uh, may may not last so fecb's um uh, major challenge from now on becomes uh, japanese intentions are they going to uh, change their minds and decide that uh, uh, the advantages to intervening outweigh uh, uh, any, uh, any 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 costs? Um, and of course, they need to monitor evolving uh, Japanese uh, uh, cap cap capability, um, and that is difficult because um, the best diplomatic insights uh, have gone. Um, and uh, there is no, and JN25, uh, the primary fleet code is unbreakable. Um, SIS has no high level source in Japan. Um, so insights into Japanese leadership thinking, you're really dependent on uh, what the embassy in Tokyo can pick up and that is, uh, and that is uh, limited. Um, capability gaps or keeping track of Japanese orbit and uh, order of battle and um, their evolving capability is a bit uh, uh, is a bit easier. You've still got the attaches in Tokyo. Um, you've got the attaches in in China. SIS now does begin to provide value because it uh, opens up liaisons with uh, with the Chinese and with the French in Indochina. Uh, and indeed with the Dutch in the Netherlands, East Indies, and all of those can uh, provide uh, uh, some, some value as well. Um, so I would say the, the picture on order of battle is, is not bad, but certain key things are, are, are missed. And I would pick out uh, the Japanese super battleship program, um, long range torpedoes, and there is a fixation that the Japanese are building uh, uh, battle cruisers, which is completely unfounded. 
Um, it remains a fixation within FECB and indeed the Admiralty in London for the next uh, for the next two years through to the end of 1941. Now, I think the other thing I'd say in this period, of course, the, the fall of France vastly complicates Britain's problems because it makes intervention clearly much more attractive to Japan. Britain is clearly now, now, now weaker. Um, there are immediate French pickings because uh, Japan can move into northern uh, Indochina, which mm. is a French colony and could easily move into the south. The French are in no position to stop them. From a British point of view, that poses uh, a serious threat because Indochina is a lot closer to uh, uh, to, uh, to to Malaya, and it gives Japan bases for both uh, uh, an amphibious attack, but uh, even more important, it gives them scope for uh, range base uh, air bases within range of uh, i think i'll just interrupt you for a second i think it's re worth reminding our viewers that we do tend to separate the eto and the pto as being kind of independent of each other but it is important to understand that the events in europe and it's not just france it's, it's netherlands, netherlands falling as well because they've got their interests in the far east so the, the 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 fall of those countries in Europe is of course having an effect, an indirect effect, if nothing else, on the on the Far East and the balance of power there. And I think it's always important to kind of balance those two theatres and and and, and realise they are that there is a the connection between them. Um, and and yeah, just just worth reminding of that. And we've mo moving into the point where we've started to get using the documents you provided. So you've got some fantastic. Yeah, well, I was going to say. Let's look at the uh, yeah yeah we've done we've done the, we've done all the introduction now so let's look at some actual documents and this is some of the stuff obviously you pulled out um, of the archives so we're talking this one is March 1940 isn't it so this is kind of just listing laying out what FECB is 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 doing I suppose so um, yes yeah, so uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to particularly dwell on this document it's 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 doing exactly that it's telling us that FECB now has its headquarters in uh, Singapore, it's a tri-service organisation, and it's giving us a sense of the principal sources. Um, so you can see military and air intelligence, SIS, I've mentioned the French, yeah. um, diplomatic and consular offices in Britain's uh, missions around the region, um, information from naval sources, that's, that's obvious. Um, uh, one source I will add here that is in fact dying out is submarine surveillance. Um, up to uh, the end of 1939, the fourth submarine flotilla based in Hong Kong has conducted regular patrols into Japanese water waters and conducted uh, uh, covert photography of Japanese naval units. And in fact, when Singapore eventually falls, some of those photographs will be found in uh, FECB headquarters when the Japanese move in due to failure to destroy everything. But if we move to the to the next one, um, this is very much relevant to what I've just said. Yep. If there are gaps in your coverage, uh, gaps in uh, um, um, intentions, what are the uh, Japanese leadership uh, thinking, gaps in uh, uh, capability. Um, in judging the risk of an attack, you have to uh, um, make assumptions. And throughout this period, indeed 1939 to the end of 1941, the British assumption of how the Japanese would execute an attack on the British Empire is, is actually, as it turns out, pretty accurate. The assumption is that uh, they can easily deploy uh, six divisions in an amphibious assault. They have adequate shipping to do that. They clearly have the Navy to give all the support that's required to uh, delivering up to six uh, divisions. They wouldn't all land at once, but, um, but very quickly, that's the, uh, the sort of invasion force they would be aiming at. And it's assumed they would cover that with uh, about 500 aircraft. Um, that's land-based aircraft. Um, and that would imply having to have uh, bases within, uh, within range of Malaya. Of course, there is the possibility that uh, 
they could provide uh, cover from, uh, from their extensive carrier fleet. The British judgment that uh, I think is not unreasonable is that while they certainly have the carriers to do that, providing sustained cover from carriers to a land offensive at this time is probably uh, uh, neither easy nor the best use of uh, Japanese resources from their point of view, and that uh, if they are going to invade Malaya, they will do everything possible to acquire bases they can use within the region. And throughout 4041, you see a dialogue between FECB and the air staff, particularly uh, the air staff in Malaya, and they recognize that um, um, the provision of uh, or the acquisition of bases in southern Indochina and the stocking of those bases with not just aircraft, but uh, all the necessary armaments is an absolutely key indicator. And that until the Japanese uh, do this, we can assume invasion is not imminent. But once it happens, it sure is. Um, now, there are other indicators that can provide war warning, and those are set out in this second uh, uh, second slide. Um, sorry. Yep. sorry, there we are. Um, I mean, there's nothing particularly um, surprising if we go to the top. Um, I mean, you would look at uh, troop concentrations developing in uh, um, embarkation points from which an invasion could be launched. Um, obviously, they're going to need the transport to move from uh, um, northern Indochina or points north of that to Malaya. Unusual naval movements, and I've mentioned concentration of shore-based aircraft. Then, of course, you get a list of uh, perhaps more nebula, nebulous indications, um, uh, diplomatic exchanges, if you can pick them up with uh, um, lower-level codes. Uh, diversion of shipping, um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and in fact, everything on this list pretty well does prove an effective uh, warning indicator in the second half of uh, of nineteen forty. But, but key question, Andrew, was it was this was it a, was this advice taken? I mean, it, it, that's the it's all very well gathering this idea that these things may happen if and when the Japanese start to go on a war footing, but Will they? Will the people that need to act on it act on it? Has the FECB got enough of a of a reputation yet? I mean, when Matt was talking yesterday about these various things that happened, they recognised the war gaming and things like that. They're they're earning this reputation that what they were doing was providing solid information. How's how's it working for FECB? Have they? What what do the naval commanders in the area think about this service? Have they? Have they? Do they trust it? Um, that is an interesting question. That there is a view that um, FECB in this uh, period, so I'm talking about the final run up to the Far East yeah. War, um, failed in a sense for exactly the reasons you're suggesting. In that, um, it's pretty accurate picture of Japanese capability um, was not sufficiently uh, absorbed and taken into account. In other words, uh, the scale and effectiveness of what the Japanese could do while being taken on board on paper was not reflected in uh, um, the necessary hard planning and hard decisions to, uh, uh, to, 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 to counter it. Um, equally, there is a parallel view that uh, uh, FECB also perhaps failed on uh, Japanese strategic intent in that uh, it allowed the idea that uh, the Japanese would pursue incrementalism to, uh, to gain traction. Now, what do I mean by incrementalism? That the Japanese would move step by step. They'd already moved into northern Indochina in late 1940. In mid-1941, they move into southern Indochina before they move into Malaya or the Dutch uh, East Indies, they'll take Thailand because that increases their options to establish jumping off points and, and air bases. Um, I think those criticisms 
uh, have some validity, but are ultimately probably unfair because they underestimate uh, just how much became available in the final months before the war and how late many of the warning indicators uh, were in taking effect. Um, and in here, we have to sort of throw in that, I mean, the British have been anticipating a threat from Japan from the early 1920s and much more seriously from the early 1930s. Japan itself never seriously contemplated an attack on Britain until mid-1940 and never began any serious planning for an attack on Singapore until, uh, un, until, that, uh, un, until that date. Um, so, um, so I think while your point is very, is, is very valid, we need to sort of keep uh, the lateness of uh, Japan making its, uh, making its decisions and giving the indications that mm. uh, can be picked up um, in uh, reaching a judgment on uh, on FECB. Importantly, we should also remember Japan has other options. When Germany invades the Soviet Union, back to your point about we can't ignore what's happening elsewhere in the world, that opens up a very attractive alternative to Japan. Why not go north and invade uh, the Soviet Union from the east? There are rich pickings, Japan might think. Wouldn't that be better and safer than uh, tangling in the south where we not only have to consider the the British Empire and the Dutch but we've got the Americans on our yeah, flank exactly. um, so I'm saying it's it's complex um, and what we still don't have as we reach the end of 1941 we don't have any break into JN25 although we do, as we will come to shortly, have purple. Yeah. Um, very quickly, I had these two next slides just to show that um, FECB does produce more strategic assessments by 1941. This one is taken from uh, uh, mid-1941, and it's looking at uh, Japanese naval production. And uh, what it's actually showing is is quite interesting because um, although it's uh, um, suggesting uh, uh, Japanese warship uh, building capacity is is quite significant if you look at the first column on that uh, on that page it's also showing that the number of ships actually uh, launched and completing is um, is surprisingly small and um, when put together with um, um, with um, information and calculations in London at this time, there is a growing realization that uh, um, there are severe constraints on Japanese uh, um, war potential and industrial capacity. It's not fully understood uh, why, and uh, it will soon become apparent that uh, if one takes a couple of examples. Japan doesn't lay down a single cruiser between uh, um, uh, early 1936 and mid-1940, so not one. Uh, Britain, in contrast, lays down a total of 32 in that time. Mm. Um, Japan um, lays down two aircraft carriers in broadly the same period. Britain lays down six. Um, so something is happening with the Japanese system, and all I'm suggesting with this uh, report is uh, it's uh, it's one pointer to something that's uh, happening happening in the background, and is suggesting that uh, Japan's long-term strength may not be all that people up to now have assumed. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we now know, of course, that rather like the, the Germans themselves, is that the Japan needs a it needs a swift conclusion when it when it starts its aggressive campaign it needs everything to be over pretty soon it just hasn't got the resources to sustain a years and years long campaign which is which, which which kind of sounds obvious now we know what happened as the war went on but this you're, you're sort of suggesting that this the british 
are almost getting an idea of this is that there's there's this initial strength the Japanese are building, but it ha it's not able to produce stuff fast enough, and there's not this the strength in depth behind essentially. Yeah, exactly right, and and it's worth adding where FECB is is particularly good uh, is on Japanese air power now. Frontline air power is formidable compared to what uh, uh, the Western forces and certainly Britain have got in the East. Um, and FECB has a pretty accurate feel for that frontline strength. But it also knows that reserves are limited. And even more important, that uh, uh, production is also limited. And in the mm. first six months of the war, that really does come home to roost. And uh, uh, by mid-1942, um, the Japanese Navy in particular is beginning to suffer from uh, a shortfall of aircraft of all, of all types. That perhaps um, usefully brings us to other things that are happening in this final phase running up to war, the relationship with the Americans. Yep. Um, and people have asked that. I should say we've had various questions, particularly from American viewers, saying how how was cooperation was there cooperation with the Americans at this point? So um, cooperation with the Americans, FECB cooperation with the Americans, um, starts as a result of the first um, uh, SIGINT meeting between uh, uh, the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy SIGINT organizations and GCMCS in Bletchley Park in February 1941. The Americans come with an important gift, which is completely relevant to the Far East. Uh, the US Army SIGINT organization, SIS, has managed to break the Purple Diplomatic Code, and they give Bletchley one of their few code-breaking machines, and that enables Bletchley to start breaking purple from, uh, um, from uh, February and uh, deliver purple intercepts, which cover Tokyo and uh, the 15 major missions around the world um, for the rest of the year and indeed through the rest, of the, the rest of the war. So that is a hugely valuable gift. In return, Bletchley gives uh, a somewhat partial briefing on uh, on Enigma, and there are controversial uh, points to that, which we, we won't go into now. Now, in parallel to that uh, major discussion and exchange, there is uh, an offshoot naval discussion between the US Navy SIGIN team and uh, Director of Naval Intelligence, Vice Admiral Godfrey, um, and the GCNCS Naval group and they decide it will be useful for FECB to open up a liaison with Station Cast, um, the US Navy SIGINT organization in the Philippines. Um, and we heard quite a lot about Cast yesterday. Yeah. That happens very quickly. It's up and running by the spring of 1941. Both FECB and Cast bring valuable things to the table. Um, in quite a few areas, they're complementary. It's usually judged, and not least by American uh, historians, that the British initially contributed most, and the British certainly contributed most on uh, the crucial JN25, on which they've been working for the last two years, and they have had significant success in reconstructing the main codebook although it is uh, not yet readable. Uh, they've been set back because the codebook changed from JN25A to JN25B in December 1940, and it has an additive cipher which changes every, every, every six months, but they're able to uh, deliver quite a few recoveries to CAST. And importantly, it convinces CAST that if we together crack on with this, and we cast ask Washington for more resources, we might just be able to do this. So that British input, I would say, is not only important in uh, getting the effort uh, effective more quickly, it's important in convincing the Americans that 
JN25 is, is breakable. Um, it's not, as it turns out, breakable before the Japanese attack, though it is soon after. Um, so that perhaps takes us as we run up to uh, um, to the war, or to the outbreak of war, those final weeks and months, which um, I was beginning to talk about uh, earlier. Um, how well does FECB do in uh, um, in giving its masters adequate war warning intelligence? Well, most of the war warning uh, pointers we saw on uh, slide two um, uh, take, take, take effect. Um, the Japanese begin withdrawing merchant ships, for example, in uh, in early October. That's picked up by the by by the British system and indeed uh, by the Americans. They've moved into Indochina. They start reconstructing constructing and uh, renovating air bases in Indochina. They begin deploying aircraft there, and FECB is able to monitor that primarily through. Uh, uh, through traffic analysis. Um, FECB picks up rather later, and we're looking now towards the end of November, the winds alert message, which was uh, mentioned last night, where the Japanese um, advise all their diplomatic posts that uh, we are going to issue um, code words for the outbreak of hostilities with America, Russia, or Japan. And there's a different trigger phase for each, all of them involving the word wins. Um, it's very much FECB that first flags that, though other parts of the British system and indeed the American system pick that message, uh, message up as well. But FECB is actually uh, first in line and gets it a day before, a day before London. Now, importantly, and again, I don't think Matt mentioned this yesterday, FECB and CAST then agree that between them, they must look for an execute message. It's all very well knowing that the Japanese are going to uh, send out this message when hostilities open, but you really want to pick it up when they do. Um, so they set up a monitoring system, and in fact, um, um, Hong Kong, um, under FECB's instruction, does pick that up uh, on the evening of uh, 7th of December, hours before the Japanese attack Malaya. 7th of December is, of course, 6th of December in, in Pearl Harbor, so it's picked up just before the, uh, the Pearl Harbor attack as well. Um, the monitoring of the air buildup in southern Indochina as we get... Uh, um, to the end of November and beginning of December is very effective. Um, and this happens very much at the last minute. The Japanese move from just over 200 aircraft in the last days of November, which is about right, as it turns out, um, to an FECB calculation a week later that they've now got 500 deployed, which again is, uh, is, exactly, is exactly right. FECB and CAST between them also do extremely well in uh, monitoring the uh, establishment of a Japanese Navy Southern Task Force, which is down, I think, in slide, uh, um, where are we? Slide, um, there we are. And um, um, this is a fine piece of work by the two organizations, FECB and CAST. It's virtually all done by traffic, tra traffic analysis, and they get most of it absolutely right. And where there are omissions, they're corrected a week later. Um, in their first stab, they don't pick up that the Japanese forces escorted by two battle cruisers, but they pick that up a couple of weeks later. What they get wrong is they believe um, the bulk of the Japanese uh, Navy, um, their aircraft carriers and uh, the bulk of their battle fleet is still in home waters, 
when, of course, the carriers are now very much en route to Pearl Harbor, escorted by uh, uh, two of the battle cruisers. Two of the four are with the Southern Task Force. Two are escorting the fleet en route to, to Pearl Harbor. Neither FECB nor CAST pick that element up, and that reflects quite skillful Japanese deception, uh, dummy broadcasts from home waters, and of course, strict radio silence with the Pearl Harbor task force. Um, perhaps I should now move to, uh, um, could the um, FECB coverage in these final weeks have saved for said um, the British naval deployment, Prince of Wales and, uh, and repulse. Uh, there is a rather poignant picture of uh, Prince of Wales leaving uh, uh, Singapore for the for the last time en route to uh, attack the Japanese landings in northern Malaya, from which, of course, she doesn't return. Um, now, my answer to this: Could they have prevent? Could FECB have done something to prevent the loss? Um, there was enough warning intelligence by the end of November when Force Z gathered in Ceylon, now modern Sri Lanka, to have justified holding the force there. By the 28th of November, it very much looks as though war may be imminent, and it increasingly looks that the Japanese are certainly headed south. And therefore, you can argue that uh, moving uh, Prince of Wales and Repulse um, onward to Singapore is going to place them in a vulnerable position. Importantly, the deterrence argument has also uh, fallen away because the British have taken steps to uh, uh, advertise Prince of Wales' arrival in Cape Town uh, in mid-November, and they know the Japanese have indeed picked this up because they have intercepted uh, the Japanese uh, Consul General in Cape Town's message back to Tokyo saying, guess what, the battleship Prince of Wales has arrived here and is bound for Malaya. So there is no requirement to turn up in Singapore in order to, to achieve a deterrent effect. The Japanese know that Prince of Wales at least is in the Indian Ocean and can easily interfere potentially with their plans. Uh, here, obviously, is a picture of uh, Prince of Wales finally arriving in Singapore. Um, the small chap in the very middle is Admiral Phillips, the new Commander-in-Chief, Eastern, Eastern Fleet. Um, now, why do the Admiralty not hold Prince of Wales in, uh, in Ceylon? I would argue for uh, um, a number of reasons. Um, they feel under pressure from the Americans to demonstrate commitment to uh, holding the Malay barrier and to supporting uh, uh, American naval forces in the, in the, in the Pacific. Um, and they feel they've got, uh, they've got time on their side. If war does break out and uh, the forces in Singapore, um, there's no reason to think that Singapore itself will be immediately vulnerable. Um, there will be time to uh, uh, to consider to consider options. Um, now, in excuse, and one should throw a couple of other things into the uh, equation um, from Admiral Phillips's point of view, and indeed the Admiralty. Admiral Phillips sitting in uh, in Ceylon, um, he would assume that if war breaks out, the British will preempt a Japanese landing in the Kra Isthmus by executing an operation called Matador, where they will move up and take possession themselves. In the event the British do not do that, and that costs them dearly in the first hours of the landing. Uh, he can also assume that uh, the submarines, and there are about 40 of the US Asiatic fleet based in the Philippines, will be a major threat to the Japanese and a major constraint on uh, Japanese aggressive moves, as indeed, of course, will be 
uh, the Pacific Fleet back in Pearl Harbor, and nobody at this point anticipates what's going to happen there. So it's not altogether surprising to see why the Americans want us forward, time on our side, um, we can consider options down the line. Now, when Phillips does arrive in uh, Singapore, he has four days before he goes off to consult with Admiral Hart in the Philippines, the commander of the American Asiatic Fleet. Now, inexcusably, at no time in that four days does he seek an intelligence briefing from, Fari, from uh, FECB, nor does the existing and outgoing commander-in-chief China fleet uh, push him to do so. And that's one of the great mysteries of this period. Why on earth would Phillips, who's been vice chief of naval staff, knows a huge amount about uh, the value of intelligence from uh, effectively running the naval war for the last two years, mm. who has been intimately involved with numerous operations involving Bletchley Park, uh, operations to acquire uh, pinches on uh, Enigma, etc., etc. Why on earth would he not uh, seek a briefing from FECB? And I, I'm unable to to answer that. And just to just jump in, because you've been talking, and I, and it's been brilliant, by the way, is that we're now entering that whole failure, essentially, of the Singapore plan and the Malaya. And we had Brian, Professor Brian Farrell on the show recently talking about Malaya. And, yeah, that's another massive great rabbit hole. That, and I suppose in the big picture of all the things that went wrong with the Malayan campaign and all the, the, the POW experiences afterwards, that, that maybe in the study of that, the the the, the um, intelligence aspect of it has been kind of lost in the lost in the crowd, so to speak. There's so much to analyze about what what went wrong over the next few weeks in that theater that the intelligence part of it is 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 is, is just very small, and it, it should have been bigger. And I can sense your um, with your deep interest and knowledge of this subject, there's a bit of resentment there that more more focus wasn't put on the intelligence aspect and and, and not listening to the uh, FECB, but yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of things going wrong in that theatre over those next few weeks. I'm sure you'll agree. Yes, um, that 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 said, um, ultimately, if Phillips had known everything FECB knew, um, would it have made a difference? To be fair to Phillips, um, I think probably probably not. Um, I think he had he had little option but to intervene to try and attack the, the landings. I think his risk management was sensible. He relied on fighter cover, weather and surprise. Um, he decided to press on knowing fighter cover would not be available, counting on surprise. But when he knew he'd been spotted by uh, uh, a Japanese aircraft, he turned back. Um, mm. You know, he realised the risks had run against him, and he did the sensible thing. Uh, he did loiter off Kuantan, where he was ultimately caught, but that was 400 miles from uh, the Japanese air bases in Indochina, and on the basis of war experience in Europe, it was reasonable to think, well, that's too far for them to have much chance of finding and fixing me and conducting a successful attack. As it happens, the Japanese had luck on their side in all sorts of ways. Anyway, I'm conscious of time. And yeah, no, I, yeah, no, it's, it's been enthralling. And I think I feel we should maybe look at the whole Malaya Singapore situation and force said in a perhaps a separate show at some point uh, in the future. But let, let's talk about let's move forward to kind of March and then up to June 1942 because yeah. there's so, still uh, a midway to bring in. So, um, so um, briefly, um, uh, after the loss of force said. Uh, FECB can contribute very little on to naval operations, and the naval SIGIN team are withdrawn from FECB at the beginning of January and dispatched to Combo. Just as they go, they make the great break along with cast into uh, JN25B. Um, and it starts to become readable and when they set up in Colombo a couple of weeks later, still working with cast, they will have that they will have that readability. 
the the army and air sections of FECB stay uh, um, another month, and then as uh, Singapore's fall becomes imminent, they withdraw to join the Dutch in Bandung in uh, in in Java, um, and that point really marks the uh, breakup of uh, the original FECB and what we see in uh, Colombo in uh, late January is essentially a remnant, the last survivor of FECB, the naval SIGINT operation, which is now badged as HMS Anderson. But very quickly, it's more successful as a SIGINT operation than it's ever been because they're reading JN25B. Yeah. And um, they are operating with cast with the Australians in Melbourne, and uh, they can also link with uh, uh, the hypo team, which we heard about yesterday in uh, in, in Pearl Harbor. Um, as we heard yesterday, um, station cast will quite quickly in February would be withdrawn to, to Australia. So the cast um, Anderson relationship uh, continues uh, uh, in Australia rather than rather than the Philippines. To give some sense of the sheer scale of the operation, um, some historians reckon that uh, Anderson processed about 30,000 intercepts in the first quarter of 1942, of which the bulk were FECB. Now, what I want to come on to now is um, um, the first major use of uh, a JN25B intercept, leading to uh, a potential ambush operation. And that was not the Coral Sea, as perhaps suggested yesterday. It was, in fact, uh, a month earlier off Ceylon. And in this um, uh, telegram here, we have um, Admiral Somerville, who has taken over from uh, Admiral Phillips, killed in the Prince of Wales, as the new Commander-in-Chief Eastern Fleet. And uh, he has uh, a mixed force gathered off Ceylon, and uh, Anderson advised him that we're pretty sure from uh, decryption of combined fleet, that's the primary Japanese fleet telegram orders, that they're contemplating an attack on uh, on Ceylon. Um, now, the problem with this uh, summary, and it's an interesting um, revelation of uh, the value and uh, issues that arise very often in uh, SIGINT, is it's, it's, it's based on a series of fragments rather than a nice, easy um, Japanese summary of their attack plan. Um, and therefore, it ends up saying the Japanese are likely to attack with two carriers and a rather small supporting force, which Somerville calculates he can deal with. He has two carriers of his own. He has the advantage of uh, surprise. He has some aerial reconnaissance, land-based aerial reconnaissance. He believes uh, the fleet air arm is very good at conducting night attacks with uh, radar-equipped albacores and swordfish, a uh, belief in which uh, he is, in my view, justified. Um, but there is a problem. The Japanese are not coming with two carriers. They're coming with five, and they're coming with four battle cruisers and very large supporting forces. Uh, they will total 275 aircraft, and uh, Somerville has barely 60. And Somerville, and furthermore, they're not coming on the 1st of April. They come uh, uh, four days later, and uh, they come from a direction much further west than Somerville anticipates. And had Somerville been in his ambush point, um, and the Japanese attacked in this way on the 1st of April, he would have been seriously embarrassed. So uh, it's an example of uh, the advantages, but also the perils of, uh, um, of, of, of SIGINT. Um, we haven't time to talk about what uh, 
um, happen subsequently. Um, Somerville remarkably is able to uh, um, recover from uh, what's in some respects a failure of intelligence and uh, uh, rather recklessly positions nevertheless in his own words to have a further crack at the Japanese and due to uh, Japanese um, I would say incompetence uh, comes extraordinarily close to pulling that off and I think it's fair to say if uh, one uh, further um, <coughs> Anderson intercept of a JN25B um, telegram on uh, the evening of uh, uh, 5th of April had reached Somerville, which it only did in garbled form, he might have been able to position for the night attack mm. and taken out a couple of Japanese carriers. And there are an awful lot of ifs in that scenario, but um, um, but it's interesting to um, reflect on whether there really was scope for a British midway um, some three months before the more famous battle. The real one, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, we, we want to. Talk, this is, of course, the war spite and the carriers involved. But let's let's finish with with the British part in the in the in role within midway because matt gave us a very good version of the american point of view and and but by 42 there is as you said earlier more cooperation between americans australians british on this it, it, within this field but um yeah pre present the british point of view of, of midway well the, the the reason i i showed these um uh these two slides uh, one one is uh, uh as is clear here it's it's somerville um, asking the Admiralty on the 20th of May, so two weeks before Midway, um, Americans believe Japanese are attacking, mid, planning an attack on Midway Island. Um, can we provide any information to shed light on this and to help? What, of course, it illustrates is that Anderson are in constant touch with Cast now in Melbourne and Hypo in Pearl Harbor, and they are all uh, still very much working together to work through whatever they can pick up on JN25. And this second slide, which is dated um, uh, 1st, 2nd of June, and uh, is an Admiralty Naval Intelligence Division report. Um, I don't expect anybody to read through the detail, but it is basically a summary of the Midway attack plan. Um, and... Uh, what is striking when one does read through it is just how comprehensive this um, JN25 decrypt is. Um, and it's interesting to see that uh, uh, the British have, have it uh, in advance. I mean, no great surprise in that, given, as I've said, that uh, Anderson and Melbourne and uh, Hypo are working together. Um, it does, I think, interestingly also underline that if... Uh, if only uh, FECB and CAST had been reading JN25B two months earlier. Yeah, a few months earlier would have made a, a key difference. And, and just to it clarify, would, Andrew, it would have made because... a key difference because imagine if they'd had the Japanese attack plan for Malaya. Yeah. And just to clarify, when we're talking about this being a British report that's alerting about Midway, are they, is, are they both... Are both FECB or Anderson by now and the the US hearing and deciphering the same messages, or are they sharing this in interpreter? Essentially, what I'm asking is, is it is this information coming from the sources two or three times, or is it just one source that's being repeated? Um, I'd say it's a it's a combination. Sometimes sometimes they are uh, they are all picking up, the, you know, they are all separately intercepting a message and, and breaking it. Other times. Somebody picks up a message, manages to crack half of it, shares the intercept with uh, with the other two, and says, "Any chance you can shed you can light fill in the on gaps. what we yeah. can't decrypt?" So it's a cooperative effort. Um, I mean, the the last point I want to make on JN twenty five B is that um, I said some while ago that uh, um, when the FECB cast relationship first took off that the British were ahead on JN25B and persuaded Cast that this was doable. 
Now, without that British input, it's worth considering, would the Americans still have broken JN25B, which only had a lifespan after it was broken of barely four months um, before it uh, changed to 25C and everyone had to uh, uh, start again. Um, I don't think it's entirely fanciful to say that without that British input, the Americans might have struggled to make that window, in which case Coral Sea and the Midway and Midway might not have happened in the way they did. So uh, I'm British. I would like to see that uh, that British uh, contribution given more recognition than it sometimes is. Um, final word, what happens to FECB or yeah. Anderson as it now is? Um, after uh, the attack on Ceylon, it's judged that Ceylon is too vulnerable to further attacks and it would be wise to withdraw the Eastern Fleet to uh, East Africa, to Kilindini in, uh, in Kenya. And quite soon, Anderson is withdrawn to Kenya as well. Now, in Kenya, Anderson is thousands of miles away from the action. It struggles to intercept much of value. Communications with uh, Melbourne, let alone Hypo, are parlous. Communications with London, for God's sake, are pretty, are pretty mm. parlous. Um, after Midway, the Americans aren't much interested in uh, the Indian Ocean, aren't, aren't disposed to give much help or even share intelligence. Um, morale plummets in uh, um, the new Anderson team in uh, in Kilindini, and uh, having uh, hit the heights. Um, in uh, the run-up to uh, the outbreak of war, um, it's now reached uh, a new Nadia, and Renaissance seems uh, a very long way, a very long way off. So it's it's a rather sad end to the story. Seven years on, the last remnant of what was the great FECB um, is uh, falling into ashes. Mm. It, it, and it there's so much from this this story of of achievement but also there's some what might have been elements as well which of course is a par for the course when you're looking at the war generally there's so much counterfactuals and what ifs and if onlys and why didn't we and but you know I, the same kind of questions I, I i put to matt at the end of his show yesterday is, is that you know with all these general histories of the far east and world war ii coming out i, I think i know what your answer is going to be but that is the intelligence aspect underrepresented in these general histories? Um, I think I'd say it, it, it's getting better. In the general histories, perhaps, yes, it's getting better. But um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of work and a lot of re-evaluation um, still, still to do. And, uh, you know, even, even talking about JN25B just now, um, I've, I've set out my view, but mm. um, I'm certainly not saying that's the last word. And I think, uh, I mean, it will be very interesting for somebody to really research uh, uh, the FECB cast story in in depth. It, it, it yeah, seems to me, to 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 interrupt you, that it's, it, it's people have been looking at this so far from a national point of view. So some people have come at it from the British angle, the American action, uh, angle, and, and the Australian angle. It seems to me that the next logical step is to, say rather than looking at one country's role to perhaps as you say look at the code and look at how the code was worked on by the various nations and indeed matt said the same point yesterday look at it from the japanese point of view as well look at what they what the intelligence picture that they are getting and how they are developing their techniques against what the allies are doing because i think that way we might get a, a clearer picture about about this whole aspect of, a, of of the theater because it, it i feel i think i said it yesterday that there's there is a lot more to be learned about this theater compared to perhaps the eto and the, and the and the russian front but yeah it's been extraordinary talking to you and i i feel that um yeah there's more to go on this added but just again folks so th these are the uh, books that the um 
Uh, the British Naval Intelligence book has been out for some time. The link to that is in the description below. And the Royal Navy's in Eastern Waters, the new paperback edition is coming out with pen and sword next month. Is that right, Andy? Next month, yep. yep. Don't know exactly yep. what date yet, but definitely next month. So they promise. So we're, we're coming to the end of things now. And, and folks, I hope you really appreciate the sort of the, 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 I was going to say a deep dive, but it's kind of a medium depth dive. I, we, we could have done less detail, but we could have also done a lot more detail. I hope. Uh, it's prompting all of you watching this to go out and look at this role in greater detail because there's so much more to code breaking than Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is very important to, our, to understanding code breaking intercepts, but there's a wider picture. There's there's other operations around the world, and I think to understand that aspect of how the Allies uh, were victorious is, is is something we can all do with with benefiting from broadening our, our research. So uh, it remains for me now to just be my, I mean, my people coming up tomorrow. I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So tomorrow. Final show in Codes and Co-Breaking Week is a kind of question show. David O'Keefe is coming on 9 p.m. UK time. We're going to look at the ultra David's work on that. Any questions you've got that you think David can answer about Enigma machines, code-breaking in general, ultra intelligence, SIGing, INT. If you want to ask him questions about Dieppe, we can do that as well. That will be tomorrow evening. And then next week, we're starting our very exciting France at War week. Uh, starting on Monday, Cedric Mass is coming on to talk about the Battle of Bir Hakim, the... Uh, French uh, stand that preceded the Battle of El Alamein. And we've got Stephen Bork talking about bombing. We've got uh, uh, Philip Nyberg coming on talking about um, Vichy France. I'm really looking forward to that. As I live in France, understanding France's role in World War II, very, very important. So that's next week. Don't forget, check out what we're doing on social media. Follow us, me on Twitter. Follow Andrew on Twitter. His uh, link is in the description below. Consider buying the books and keep spreading the word about what we're doing. And if you would like to, please consider becoming a patron. I really want to con continue doing this full-time next year not have to go back into guiding i do like guiding but i'm finding i'm enjoying this more so consider uh, uh giving me a monthly contribution of a couple of quid it all helps this go but right now it just reminds me to say thank you very much dr andrew boyd and yeah i really enjoyed that and if we do something else about naval intelligence i i will welcome you to come back and talk about it at further length but in, in right now good luck with the book i hope the sales go through the roof i hope you enjoy uh, carrying on researching this subject and thank you for joining us well thank you i enjoyed it too brilliant well this is paul woodard for world war ii tv i will see you all again tomorrow night for the question show saying thank you very much for your company this afternoon or this evening depending on where you are watching us thank you everybody good have a good day bye bye